Uh, this is a topic that I um, <clears throat> am very passionate about. I've been doing a lot of work in food waste uh, prevention and reduction recently. And so I'm very excited that all of you were um, interested enough in this topic to join me this evening. So thank you for being here. Um, as Lauren said, my name is Jennifer Shikaitis, and I work at Rutgers Cooperative Extension in the Department of Family and Community Health Sciences. Um, I'm presenting tonight on um, presenting tonight on preventing and reducing food waste at home. Um, I just want to acknowledge that my uh, my wonderful coworker Sarah El Nakib, our department chair, she and I have been doing um, a lot of food waste work together. Um, she created these slides, and I'm going to be presenting the information to you tonight. Um, before I get into our topic for this evening, I hope you don't mind if I just take a couple of minutes um, to tell you about the department that I work in and where I'm coming from, so that you know who I am and and what I do and what Cooperative Extension does. So. Um, as I mentioned before, I work at Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Now, Cooperative Extension is actually a national system that has been around for over 100 years. So when Cooperative Extension was first established, it was established because, um, well, there was a, a group of very smart people that got together and realized that there's all this wonderful stuff happening at universities around the country. There is research and materials and resources. Um, and there really uh, needed to be a way for all of that good stuff to be more accessible to the general public, to the community. So the idea of cooperative extension came about and was established uh, to be that connection, to be the bridge between the university and the community so that all of the great stuff that's housed in universities um, had a way to reach the rest of the, the public, to the rest of the community. Um, so within cooperative extension, there are three main departments. They're listed on your screen there. You'll see them under the red writing. Um, so you'll see the first one is agriculture and natural resources. That department works um, with the farming community, also with home gardeners. If you've ever heard of the Master Gardeners program, that program is um, run through the agriculture and natural resources department. The second department is 4-H, youth development. Um, I think that's probably the most well-known of the three departments in Cooperative Extension. Uh, they run a number of really wonderful um, evidence-based youth programming and education programs. Um, they're also the ones who run the county fairs every summer. So if you ever attended a county fair, um, that uh, it was <clears throat> most likely put on by 4-H. And then finally, there's my department, which is Family and Community Health Sciences. My department provides education and programming in the areas of health, nutrition, and wellness. Um, we are county-based. So in New Jersey's 21 counties, we have 20 county extension offices. And generally, uh, we have faculty and staff from all three of the departments that I mentioned in each of the counties. And those faculty and staff are um, responsible for serving the county in which they work. Um, the uh, great thing about working with Cooperative Extension educators like myself is that you can feel uh, confident that you are getting evidence-based, research-based information and programming um, and um, reliable information presented to you. And um, we are provided as a service on behalf of Rutgers to support the community. So the programming that we offer is generally offered at no cost or sometimes for a nominal fee, depending on what services you're accessing. Um, so I'm, that's who I am, where I work, what we do, where I'm coming from. So thank you for listening to that. And now we can move on with our topic for today. Oh, before that, then I get to show this just to, um, make sure that everyone here understands that Rutgers is an equal opportunity employer and we provide programming, um, um, to everyone, regardless of, um, any, um, affiliations. So that is also for you guys. Okay. So now we can get into our topic for today on reducing food waste at home. This is our agenda, just so you know what to expect and what we're gonna be covering tonight. So first I'll go over just some background and statistics on food waste so you know sort of the state of things as they stand right now. Um, we'll talk about where food waste occurs in the food system. Then I will talk about food waste legislation in the United States and um, in New Jersey, including the goals that have been set for food waste reduction. And finally, we'll talk about um, what you can do about food waste at home and beyond a little bit as well. And then I will introduce you to some additional resources that you can refer to um, to um, continue to uh, Im implement these um, ways to reduce food waste. So. 
first, the facts. Here's a little background. So um, on average, each person in the United States wastes about um, 20 pounds or more of food per month. That over time, okay, that equals about 288 pounds of food um, a year. Overall, um, we waste a lot of food in this country. About 30 to 40% of our food supply is wasted. In the year 2010, about 133 billion pounds of food, which is the equivalent of about $161 billion from US um, retail food stores, restaurants and homes um, went uneaten and ended up as trash. And when we waste food, it's not only the physical food that's wasted, like what you see in the picture here. It's not just food scraps, like the physical, physical um, remnants of the food that we don't eat. There's a lot that goes into producing the food that ends up on our plates. So when, when we waste that food that you see there, we are also wasting the land, the water, the labor, the energy, and all the other inputs that go into producing processing, transporting, preparing, storing, packaging, and disposing of discarded food. So um, we tend to not see that part of the food system, and maybe we don't think about it very much. Um, you know, we're fortunate enough to live in, in a country where food is plentiful, and we can go to, you know, any of our local stores and get food anytime we need it. Um, but there is a lot of work that goes into ensuring that food is grown and and gets to where it's supposed to go. Um, so all of that stuff goes to waste too when we end up wasting food. Um, <clears throat> food waste and landfills cost Americans a lot of money. In fact, it costs about $2 billion per year, okay? Um, and a lot of this is preventable. So that's why you're here today, right? To learn about how we can prevent this from happening and hopefully reduce the cost of this, um, this very expensive problem that we are, that we've created in this country. I also wanted to just draw attention to um, the fact that food waste also has a big environmental impact, okay? Um, Project Drawdown, which is a nonprofit um, organization, uh, they issued a report that um, said that to stop at two degrees of warming <clears throat> when it comes to climate change, these are the most important things to focus on. And food reducing food waste, as you can see, is right at the top. Um, they also listed the, the other um, factors that you can see, see there. So like health and education, plant-rich diets, which goes into food waste as well, um, refrigerant management, tropical forests, all these other things. But um, I thought it was really, really it, impactful to see that reducing food waste was right at the top. Um, so reducing food waste is not only an expensive problem, but um, it's also one that's harming our planet. All the food that goes into landfills produces methane, which is a greenhouse gas, um, which contributes to um, climate change. So I wanted to draw your attention to this. Um, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture and the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, um, teamed up a few years ago to issue the first ever food waste, uh, I should say food waste reduction challenge, not food waste challenge, food waste reduction challenge is a better way to put that. Um, so on September 16th, 2015, um, the, uh, these two agencies teamed up to um, create the first ever national food loss and waste reduction goal in the United States. And it calls for a 50% reduction by the year 2030. So a 50% reduction in um, the, the solid food waste that we are creating in this country. And um, we are lucky enough to live in a state that also is kind of on the forefront of um, understanding and addressing the issue of food waste. Um, so in August 2017, <clears throat> the food waste bill S3027 was signed, and this establishes the 50% reduction in municipal solid waste food, um, uh, food waste by the year 2030. Okay. Um, and then the food waste bill A3056, also signed in 2017, August 2017, um, that requested guidelines to be written for K through 12 and higher education institutions 
to reduce, recover, and recycle food waste. The reason that schools are targeted is because schools tend to be large producers of food waste for a number of reasons. Um, and so targeting institutions like that, um, you know, just uh, helps to ensure that a lot of food can also be saved from going to waste. Um, so these uh, guidelines have now been written. They're uh, available for free. Um, to, uh, to download or read online. And so I will be um, providing links to those um, later on if anyone's interested in, in accessing those. Okay, I wanted to take a minute now to talk about the difference between um, food waste and food loss. Okay, so food waste, um, <clears throat> food waste happens downstream in the food supply chain. Um, so this is like at the, at the end basically of the, of the food system, right, where we are as consumers, such as retail or consumer level, that's considered food waste. So in other words, food that is edible, but that somehow still ends up in the trash, that is considered food waste. Whereas food loss, this happens upstream in the food supply chain, such as at the production, harvest and storage stages, that's generally considered food losses. Um, and I just wanted to make this distinction because what we're focusing on today is food waste. So the, the, the part of the food system that is really in front of us as consumers and that we have some control over as individuals. Um, unless you work on a farm or um, are involved in the food system somehow, um, the food loss issue is really beyond our control. Right. So today we're focusing on food waste, um, the stuff that is generally edible, but that ends up in the in the landfill anyway. OK, what you're seeing here is um, a graphic that the Environmental Protection Agency has published, and it's called the Food Recovery Hierarchy. Um, we could also call it the Food Waste Reduction or Prevention Hierarchy. And what it is, it's an illustration of um, the, uh, the ways that we can get rid of food ranked from most desirable to least desirable. So um, you'll see on the left there, there's like the little arrow, the little line, and it says it's going from most preferred to least preferred on the way down. So that means that the um, ways to reduce food waste that are most desirable are listed at the top, and then it, it goes in order from most desirable ranked down to least desirable. So I want to highlight this because um, <clears throat> I think it gives us a good idea of um, how to deal with the with food waste when we're faced with it, right? So the first one that you'll see there, the most desirable way to reduce food waste is source reduction. Um, if we could somehow produce exactly as much food as people will eat, that would be ideal, right? Because then none of it would go to waste. Um, we just produce exactly as much as we know people will eat. And then, you know, that's it. There's nothing really much else to deal with. However, um, I, I'm sure you can imagine that that is a very, very difficult thing to achieve for a number of reasons. There's no way to predict with any sort of, you know, sort of accuracy exactly what will be eaten and how much will be eaten by people. Um, so there are some ways to, to do some source production, um, but it's, it's one of the more difficult ones to address. Also, it's out of really our control unless you happen to be a farmer or in the food system somewhere. So the next most desirable way um, to deal with food waste is to feed hungry people. So if you have extra food, you could eat it, <laughs> share it with a friend or donate it. You can donate it to um, food banks, soup kitchens, shelters, basically anyone who will eat it, um, you can donate that food to. Um, underneath that, the, the next most desirable way is to feed animals. Um, and this is generally something that institutions tend to um, participate in. So, for example, at Rutgers, where I work, um, a lot of the food scraps from our um, uh, cafeterias and um, food outlets on campus are diverted to a pig farm in Pennsylvania. Um, so, um, so that way they, you know, get to eat the, the food scraps and the farmers benefit because then they, you know, get this, this extra food that otherwise would go to waste. Um, so that is the next most desirable way. <clears throat> Underneath that is industrial uses. So providing waste oils for rendering and fuel conversion and food scraps for digestion to recover energy. Um, underneath that is composting to create a nutrient rich soil amendment. And some people, when they see this hierarchy and they see that compost is like close to the bottom, they get a little bit surprised or disappointed. Um, the reason composting is a good way to get the nutrient rich soil. The reason that it's at the bottom <clears throat> or close to the bottom 
is because in terms of um, using the calories in food efficiently, it's not the most efficient way to do that. It uh, doesn't mean that you shouldn't compost if that's, a, especially if you're just, if you're using scraps, like things that are, are the, the inedible parts of food, like eggshells, for example, or the peels of, of fruits and vegetables. Um, but if there's edible food, it's more efficient to use it in one of the ways that are listed above composting than to compost it. Okay. And then finally, at the very bottom is landfill or incineration, basically the trash, right? Putting edible food into the trash, which is what we tend to do the most. So, so right now, what we're looking at, like the state, the, the state of, of things as they stand now in this country is really an inverse of this hierarchy. So we are putting most of our edible food waste into um, uh, the garbage, you know, which goes to a landfill or incineration. Um, and um, the uh, the source production is the, you know, not what we're doing the most of or, or enough of. Um, so I just wanted to put this out there because as people who are attending this program, and I'm, I'm assuming you're interested in reducing food waste. So as you are looking for ways to deal with the, the food waste that you have in your own homes, you can maybe keep this in mind um, when you're trying to figure out what to do with the food. Okay, and um, I can also share this infographic or you can Google it, it's readily available if you just Google food recovery hierarchy um, to keep in mind. Okay, so um, when it comes to food waste at home, um, there are um, a few main drivers that uh, cause food waste in our homes. So we'll look at those right now. So first of all, it's a lack of awareness, right? Um, a lot of people might not realize just how uh, big the problem of food waste is or how harmful it is. Um, confusion over date labels. This is actually um, a big issue that um, there's a, a big movement now to, to create better education around date labels because a lot of people think, oh, something's getting close to the date that's on the food, I better get rid of it. Or maybe it's the date that it's that's labeled or a date passed, oh, I need to throw it out, um, which is not the case. And I'll go into a little more detail about that later, but that is a big driver of food waste at home. Poor storage, you know, not refrigerating things that need to be refrigerated, not, um, you know, covering things that need to be covered, not freezing things that need to be freeze, uh, frozen. Um, and then, you know, the food winds up going, going bad, um, getting stale, whatever the case may be. Big driver of food waste. Poor planning, right? I mean, you know, it happens to the best of us where um, even when we do our best, sometimes things don't work out very well. So not planning your meals, um, uh, you know, buying too much or making too much and then having extra that goes to waste, for example. Impulse buying and purchases, which sort of goes hand in hand with poor planning, um, right? But when we maybe purchase things, if you ever go food shopping hungry and you buy things that maybe you, <laughs> you wouldn't normally buy if you if you weren't hungry, things like that. And overproduction, so just making more than is necessary. Um, I think especially we may have seen that around the holidays. Um, I, I know that, you know, I do this if I'm having people over, I sometimes tend to panic and think we don't have enough food, which we always do. We always end up with way more food than we need. Um, and, but that is also a big driver of um, um, food waste at home is overproduction, making too much. Okay. Um, so just looking at some solutions that um, we can implement. So, um, you know, keeping in mind the, the food waste reduction goals that have been established, that 50% reduction by the year 2030, um, I do want to acknowledge that uh, solutions really do need to take place on, on two main fronts here, um, a macro like policy level front, okay, so things like educating about food um, uh, date labels um, and um, things in the food system, and then also at a micro level and individual level. Okay, so I'm going to present some solutions here. The policy level solutions are ones that are really not within our individual control, but I think they're worth mentioning just to raise awareness um, of the factors that influence our behavior when it comes to food waste. And then we'll talk about the individual level as well. So here are some things <clears throat> that could be done at a policy level. <clears throat> Excuse me, just get some water here. And this is not an exhaustive list. These are just a few examples that we um, that can be done and that uh, are starting to be done now. So simplifying date labels on food, making it easier for the general public, for consumers to understand what date labels mean um, <clears throat> and how to interpret them. 
um, educate on better food management. It's something that, you know, food, food education is not something that is really um, provided in schools or on any sort of, you know, uh, general um, level for people. And so um, we see the results of this in people not understanding how to store food properly, um, how to cook food properly, um, how to, you know, plan meals and, and do all the things that go into ensuring that we're not wasting a lot of food. Providing infrastructure for composting. I think it's something that can be done on an individual level, but it takes a really good amount of um, individual desire and um, effort to do so. Right? It's not something that is very uh, common. It also can be done on a larger level, like on a municipal level. So um, there's a starting to be a, a push now for, um, for better infrastructure for composting um, at larger levels, like, a, for example, on the municipal level. So now on the individual level, um, there are lots of things that we all can do to prevent food waste from happening in our home. Uh, planning before shopping, and I'll, I'll uh, go over some tips about that in a few minutes. Um, understanding date labels. Um, I will actually, uh, I have a lot of resources available that um, I can make available to you. So either by sending them to the library and they can email them out, or maybe they can make them available on um, on one of their uh, uh, you know, web pages or something. Um, but there's a lot of information out there. It's just that people are not aware. So there's um, information on how to read date labels and how to understand them so that you're not wasting food unnecessarily. We can just prepare the right amount of food, <clears throat> right? So um and this takes some practice, you know, especially maybe if you're, um, you know, new to cooking or something or cooking for more people than you're used to, um, you know, it happens that there's leftovers, but not not um, really seriously overdoing it, trying to prepare just the right amount of food that, you know, people will eat. Uh, freezing food before it spoils, decluttering the fridge in the kitchen and sharing food. I mean, it sounds very simple, but it's a great way to reduce food waste. You know, offering food to your neighbors, your friends, family, um, or donating. <clears throat> okay, so planning your meals and shopping trips. Um, I know it sounds like a very simple thing to do, but it can actually have a big impact on um, on the amount of food that you that you eat and waste. And um, I'll talk in, in a minute again with some more tips on planning meals and shopping trips. A proper storage is key and also um, expiration dates, okay? Use it, don't lose it, basically. Use whatever food you can. My, I get made fun of a lot for my um, meals that I bring into work because they're just kind of like a crazy mishmash of stuff that I find in my fridge. Like today, actually, I had like some roasted potatoes and a yogurt and um, some broccoli. And that was my, you know, my lunch. It was like a weird mix of things, but, you know, it was, it was what I had and I'd rather eat it <clears throat> Then, uh, then let it go to waste or spend a lot of money on like, you know, eating out or something. Um, so um, planning meals. It's something that I think sounds pretty simple and is a fairly simple thing to do, but actually can take a good amount of, um, there's a learning curve involved, right? It's not, it doesn't come naturally. It's not something that is um, always the quickest and easiest thing to do. But with a little bit of practice, it can become um, a little bit easier and a little more uh, natural for us to, to plan our meals a little better. Um, so creating weekly meal plans for easy shopping and cooking. Um, just, you know, planning out, okay, for dinners, this is what I'm gonna have. This For lunches, this is what we're gonna have. For breakfast, this is what we're gonna have. If this feels overwhelming to you, if this is something that you're not used to doing, um, if you are not an experienced cook, this can feel like a lot. So, um, you know, start out small. If this is something that you want to maybe try to tackle a little bit more at home, start with two dinners a week, two lunches a week. Breakfast, I feel like, is generally easier. Um, uh, usually, you know, it's, it's like something quick in the morning. I think the the lunches and the dinners are probably the one that the the meals that are a little trickier to, to actually plan out and think about and and uh, you know make sure that you're you're planning well for and shopping well for. Um, so meal planning not only helps reduce food waste, it can also help you identify nutrition gaps in your diet. It can also save you a lot of money. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a weekly meal planner. We, my department actually has an entire webinar on meal planning. Um, so um, I can share that link with you if you're interested. Um, that's another whole probably 45 minute webinar, hour webinar that I won't go into too much detail now, but just, you know, understanding that planning your meals 
planning your shopping can have a big impact on food waste. You can make sure you're just getting the, um, the foods that you need when you're going shopping. So when it comes to planning your shopping trips, um, just a few tips, not an exhaustive list again, but these are just a few tips that can help you to um, reduce food waste when you're planning your meals and your shopping. So the first one, uh, take inventory of your pantry and your fridge and your freezer. Check to see what you have first before going shopping. How many times have you, you know, gone shopping and then gotten home and said, oh, I already have a, you know, a, a peas in my freezer or, you know, about this box of cereal. Um, and then it ends up going stale or something because you already had some. Um, so taking a quick inventory um, can really, you know, help to ensure that you're not uh, buying food that you already have and that you don't need. Um, you can even just like take a quick picture with uh, um, your phone of like what's in your fridge or what's in your pantry, or your freezer or, you know, in your cupboards um, so that when you go shopping, you can just refer to that quickly and, and know what you need to get and what you don't need to get. Um, simply making a grocery list can help to reduce food waste, right? And also sticking to that list. <laughs> um, so that goes along with meal planning, but knowing exactly what you need to buy will help to just get what you need for the meals that you know you're going to have. Um, I think that one thing that I used to do when I first, you know, when my kids were younger and I was trying to figure out how to feed like a larger family is I would get things and be like, oh yeah, I'll, you know, I'm sure I'll try this one day. Um, but really, realistically, as you know, a household that has two full-time working parents and three kids um, who are active in all kinds of different things, um, we tend to kind of stick to the same things. It makes, you know, my life easier, more predictable. And that way, you know, I, I, so now I have this rule. Okay. If I don't know when I'm going to eat it, I'm not going to buy it. So, uh, making that list and sticking to it, um, buying smaller amounts of foods that will expire quickly, like fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, keep in mind, you know, this is not always the easiest thing to do. And I understand that. Um, it means that you might have to take more frequent trips to the stores if you're, but if you um, are buying smaller amounts that you have to go back and replenish. Um, but you know, you, if you're thinking you had two or three days of what you actually will eat just in those two, three days, buy the fruits and vegetables that you know you will eat in those two, three days, and then that's it. Um, for more tender, less hearty produce, you can um, opt for the frozen produce, um, especially if you're going to use it in things like soups or chilies or, you know, stews or something like that, where maybe the texture is, um, you know, not as important. Um, frozen is a great option. I often get the question, well, what about nutrition? Um, when it comes to frozen produce, that is considered nutritionally um, equal with fresh. Okay, sometimes they even um, can tend to be more nutritious because um, the, at the point at which produce is frozen is generally very soon after it's picked. Whereas if you buy fresh produce, sometimes it actually has been a week or more since it was picked and harvested until you actually buy it by the time it's picked and cleaned and packaged and transported to where it's to where, you know, to your local store, for example. Um, so frozen is a great option. Canned is a good option too. You just want to make sure you watch the, um, the, the sodium in those, because those can be, you know, have a lot of added sugar, sodium and preservatives. When it comes to um, proper storage, there uh, this is key also in preventing food waste. You don't want to let things you know go bad sitting there um, for too long. So you want to practice the first in first out method or FIFO, okay? Um, and that is just simply moving older items to the front of the fridge or to the the cupboard or the pantry so you can use them first. Okay, so set up an eat first section in your fridge or on your counter or in your pantry so that you know um, that those are the things that may, you know, uh, lose quality or go bad or, or go stale first. So you're going to eat those first. Okay, um, so just the way you arrange your fridge can actually have a great impact on how much food you eat and how much food you waste. Keep your fridge clutter free. It's easy to waste food if you don't see it. I mean, how many times have you gone to clean out your fridge and there's something in the back and you've gone, oh, I you know, didn't even realize this was here. Then you had to throw it out because it was, you know, rotten or something. Um, so um, out of sight, out of mind. And that's, you know, that's true here when it comes to food too. And if it's out of mind, it's probably going to go bad and go to waste. Keep in mind that your freezer is a great option. Um, if it is within your means and, you know, you have the space in your home and it's within your budget to buy like an extra freezer to, um, put in your basement or, or in the garage or 
or somewhere, even a small one, um, it's worth it. Uh, they're often, you know, not super expensive, and um, it's a great way to ensure that you can keep food longer. So when food get, gets close to being spoiled, consider freezing it to extend their shelf life. Um, consider alternate uses, too, for foods. Like, so, you know, bananas that are a little past their prime, you can freeze those and then make, use them to make banana bread later or smoothies. Um, <clears throat> be sure to date when you make foods and then when you when you freeze them as well so that you know exactly how long uh, something has been in the fridge and you can make sure to eat it in an appropriate time period. Um, separate items into smaller portions before freezing them. This will actually, you know, help to ensure that you will actually eat it. Um, there's a whole area of study, whole field of study called behavioral economics. And it's, uh, you know, this, this idea that our environment influences our behavior. And it's the the, the rationale behind why when we go to so many stores, there's all these little things right at the counter when we check out, because that uh, increases the likelihood that we will grab something and buy it, right? So that's a behavioral economics thing. Um, it's simple, right? There's small things that we can easily, you know, grab. They're small enough that we can grab them easily, put them in our cart or in our, our, um, our basket, and um, they're not too expensive. And so likelihood is that, you know, we will uh, grab something and 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 buy it right at the end there. So this is along the same lines. If it's easy to get out of the fridge and heat up quickly, we are more likely to eat it, right? So if you're freezing like soup, for example, instead of freezing like a big portion, like a, a big, you know, like a container of soup, separate it out into smaller containers, like maybe, you know, one or two servings. So you can heat it up just for yourself or just for two people in your house. Um, put it in the fridge, in the freezer like that so that it's easy to grab and reheat and you don't have to like chisel away at it to try to get, you know, the, just the amount that you need or heat up this whole thing that, that you're then not going to eat the entire thing of. Um, continuing with proper storage. Um, you want to make sure that your fridge and your freezer are at the proper temperatures to ensure that the food stays safe and stays good for as long as possible. Um, so your fridge, you want it to be at 40 degrees or lower. Usually it's like 37 is what is recommended. And your freezer should be at zero degrees or lower. So you just maybe want to check that to make sure that your fridge is at the proper temperature and making sure everything stays cold. Uh, and for produce that we don't refrigerate, such as bananas, apples, tomatoes, um, potatoes, you know, things that you don't put in your fridge, um, you want to try to separate those because uh, a lot of the um, these um, foods emit ethylene gas and that causes them to ripen at different rates. So, um, so for example, if you have apples and bananas together, bananas release this gas and will cause the, the, banana, the apples to ripen more quickly, go bad more quickly, and then they're, you know, you might be more likely to throw them out if you don't eat them in time. So you want to separate these things, um, you know, maybe have a couple different bowls on your counter or the tiered bowls so that you can put different produce in different baskets. Okay. When it comes to food labeling, um, I think this is an issue th uh, that a lot of people, um, there's a lot of confusion over. Um, and people feel compelled to uh, throw something away the minute it turns midnight on the date that is on, um, you know, on their food label. So let's just uh, talk about these a little bit. Um, most, you know, date labels are for food quality and not food safety. So sell-by dates are used by the manufacturer to recommend to the store when a product should be sold to a customer for best quality over its expected shelf life. So it kind of like, you know, hits this peak and then maybe, you know, the quality, maybe the flavor tends to, um, you know, wane over time or something like that, but it's not because of food safety. It's not where on that date, this food is no longer good. You got to get rid of it. Um, <clears throat> best buy dates indicate to the customer when the manufacturer ensures the product will have its best quality, it is also not meant to indicate food safety. Use by dates are also set by the manufacturer to indicate to the customer when the product is at its peak quality. Okay, so sell by, best by, and use by dates do not indicate food safety. Um, so eating food after its best buy, use by, or sell by date means that the product might not taste as good as if it were fresh, but it should not indicate any food safety concern. One very important exception to this rule. 
there is a very important exception to this, infant formula. Since infants get their sole nutrition from infant formula and nutrients in any food can uh, degrade over time, infant formula should not be used after it's used by date since it could result in malnutrition, which could be life-threatening for the infant. So that is the one exception to this rule. It's an important exception, so I always wanna bring it up. Um, but other than that, um, these are not food safety um, labels, but rather food quality. Okay. Um, another way to reduce food waste is, you know, <laughs> use and reuse leftovers. So love your leftovers, use them up for your next meal or in new recipes. Um, we were, we were calling that hierarchy that I showed you, the, the second most desirable way to deal with food waste is to feed people, <laughs> give it to people, have them eat it. So offer extra leftovers to your friends, neighbors, family, whoever, you know, you think might actually eat it. Um, you can also donate unopened, non-perishable foods to the food bank. If you are trying to donate food, I would strongly suggest that you call ahead to make sure that um, whatever institution you are hoping to donate to is willing to accept whatever it is that you have to offer. Um, some, you know, some soup kitchens, for example, or, or shelters, food pantries, et cetera, have rules around what they are allowed and not allowed to accept. So, um, it would just save you some time and maybe frustration if, you know, going, going somewhere, trying to make a donation and then having them not accept it. So make a phone call first and ask about what they'll accept. Um, encourage guests to take all leftovers home with them. Um, I know I'm always thrilled to take leftovers home. It means one less meal for me to have to plan and think about and cook and, and all that. So, um, yeah. You can also learn to preserve food. Our department actually offers um, a master food preservers course um, to learn how to can, pickle, freeze, and ferment food to preserve them. Um, and uh, this is a really awesome way to uh, ensure that you have, you know, food that maybe you have grown in your garden, for example, um, and don't want to go to waste and you can have those for months to come. Um, if you can't offer your food to, to feed to people or pets, um, or, or other, you know, other animals. You can also consider backyard composting. Um, you can also send the food scraps to composting facilities. These are more readily available to some people depending on where you live. It's worth making a phone call to your, um, your township, your city, wherever you live, or maybe surrounding towns to see um, uh, if any of the, if the town you live in or any surrounding towns does have a food waste um, composting facility. Um, sometimes it's easy enough just to collect the food scraps and, um, you know, once a week or so, uh, bring it over to, um, to that facility. Um, I also, you know, if, even if I have like a little bit of food left now on my plate and it's something that I have a, a, a dog. So, um, if it's not really enough to keep like for leftovers, instead of putting it in the trash, I'll just put it in her, her bowl. Cause now I know from looking at that hierarchy that it's better to feed an animal than to put it in the trash or, you know, compost it, for example. So uh, Rutgers has tons of resources when it comes to food waste um, education and um, more information. So um, we have fact sheets, we have um, uh, webinars. Our, my department actually, uh, when uh, COVID shut everything down, my department started a program called Wellness Wednesdays. So every Wednesday we have a free webinar available to the general public. They just have to register about um, you know, all topics related to health, nutrition, wellness, food, um, all kinds of things. And we have a few webinars that are related to um, uh, reducing food waste, including meal planning, um, reducing food waste, um, food safety, uh, food preservation. So I would encourage you to check out, um, we have the, the archive of webinars, the past webinars going back to May 2020. So lots to choose from. Um, so educating yourself on various ways you can prevent food waste. So, you know, just the proper food storage, food safety, food preservation, um, et cetera. So I can also send links to all these things um, if anyone is interested in receiving them. Um, these are some other resources. Um, there is the Food Keeper app that is um, by the, uh, the USDA and that um, on the right there, that's what you see there, the Food Keeper app. And that uh, is a really, really wonderful resource. It's available for free. You can download it on your smartphone if you have a smartphone. And um, this helps you to understand um, 
whether the food that you have is, is safe to eat, is good to eat, how long you can keep it for, um, alternate uses for the food that you may not have thought of. Um, so it really can help you to reduce food waste. Um, there's also um, articles and fact sheets on understanding food uh, food label uh, uh, date um, labels on foods that I can share with you. Um, so I can send all these resources either via email or I can share them with the library and they can maybe post them somewhere. So we'll figure out how to get those to you. So these are some next steps. Um, watch a healthy meal planning presentation, the webinar that I told you about. So I can, I can make that link available for you. So get a head start on next week's shopping by creating a meal plan. Even if it's just one or two meals that you want to start off small with just to kind of you know, figure out how to do it, uh, it's, a, it's a great place to start. Um, clean out your fridge and cupboards. So create a, an eat first section in your fridge and your cupboards and your pantry, wherever you keep your food. Um, and put your items in first out, first in, first out order, FIFO. So to make sure that the things that are a little bit older are at the front and more accessible. Again, just thinking about that behavioral economics thing. What are you more likely to do based on how things are set up, right? When we open our fridge, what's right in front of us, we tend to grab more easily. So put those things right in the front. Um, you can down the US, download the USDA's Food Keeper app to so start exploring the food that usually goes bad in your house figure out how to prevent that from happening, how to store it properly, um, how to read those date labels, how to prevent that food from going bad. And then for extra credit, sign up for more Wellness Wednesdays. That's our program that we have to learn more about um, food and nutrition and um, how to stay well, including uh, preventing food waste. <laughs>